Gauteng remains the economic heartbeat of South Africa, contributing some 34% to the national GDP. And the province today laid out its 2019 budget statement. And as always, there's more to be done with the little that we have. More on the help the provincial government wants to extend to struggling municipalities with Gauteng Finance MEC Barbara Creasy. Also on the show, Mines Minister Gwede Montashe discusses the mining sector, the role he is playing in the Sibanya Steel Water versus Amku standoffs, and the job shedding in this shrinking sector. I am Karabole Tata. You're watching Political Capital. We'll be bringing you some of those discussions later in the show. But first, it was the lowest voter turnout in the 20-year democratic history of Africa's most populous nation. But despite that and an economy that's failed to recover since the recession of 2016 and the unenviable status of being crowned the world poverty capital, many Nigerians still voted for Muhammadu Buhari's APC party. So why? I had a chat with Dr. Bongo Adi, who is a senior lecturer and economist at Lagos Business School. Dr. Ali, Muhammadu Buhari, in his first term as president, averaged some 0.9% growth. That is a far cry from catching up with Nigeria's population rate. So I'm going to ask a question that the whole world, of course, wants to ask, which is, why did Nigerians vote for same old, same old? What hope do they have? Yeah, um, that's a, a very... Um a very big question because um, right now many Nigerians still believe uh, that the election didn't go as expected. Um, during the, the the election, the presidential election um, about two weeks ago, uh, there was massive uh, voter repression in some parts of of Nigeria. What do you mean? Some ethnic groups. Um, like the Igbos who live in Lagos, were prevented from voting. And there were marked violence in several um, parts of the country. But unfortunately, uh, these situations were sort of uh, ignored by the international observers. So many Nigerians are wondering where they got their information from. It doesn't appear that they were in Nigeria, because if they were, they would have noticed that the election was largely manipulated in so many places. And uh, the, that is the reason why the opposition candidate has not found it worthy to call and congratulate the winner, who is the, uh, uh, the, the incumbent president, uh, President Mohammed, Mohammed Buhari. Um, so many people still believe that the election was not won, um, and then uh, today is Tuesday. The opposition party, the People's Democratic Party, um, has assembled um, a team of lawyers, and I'm sure that today they have approached the courts. So, so, as far as Nigeria's election is concerned, we still think that the jury is still out. It has not been decided yet. Dr. Adi, Dr. Adi, clearly you expect some challenge to these uh, following the Nigerian presidential elections, and that will mostly be led by the opposition, of course, of Atiku Abubakar. But regardless of who is Nigeria's president, the problems still remain the same. You have now the unenviable title of being the world's poverty capital, overtaking India in that regard. Really, I mean, what kind of monetary policy does Nigeria need to get out of a rot that has been in since 2016, really, since that recession? If, if you look at the data, I made a presentation to the alumni of my school, uh, Lagos Business School, uh, just last week on the economic outlook for 2019. One of the things I pointed out um, is the misalignment in monetary and fiscal policy. So we have had this um, uh, post uh, economic strategy uh, going on for over three years now since 2016 when the country um, got into recession. Now, it might interest people to know that uh, the recession of 2016 uh, has not, it wasn't the worst recession that Nigeria has experienced in its uh -huh. history. 
1978, in 1986, mm -hmm. we, we had a far worse uh, recession than was recorded in 2016. But in those periods, when the economy bounced out of the recession, it re recorded um, significant growth, sometimes some, between uh, 5 and 7 percent in those periods. Uh, and that was a period that oil price wasn't as, um, as uh, uh, high as it is today. So because the government of the day in Nigeria has always blamed the poor performance on low oil prices. But of course, that is not sustainable because uh. we know that even when oil prices were worse than it is right now, uh. the economy uh, was growing. So it all points to the poor management of the economy, especially the macroeconomic uh, uh, misalignment that I pointed out earlier, the misalignment between fiscal policy. The government, on the one hand, is trying to grow or you know, reflect the economy, but on the other side, uh, the macroeconomic strategies do not uh, support that. And so that's we've exactly, had um, a very high... That's exactly yes. one of the points I wanted to bring to the fore. Now, when you look at it, I mean, Nigeria, oil to Nigeria has been a gift and a curse in a sense. It's because of the oil price that the, the economy, which, is, which generates some 80% of its uh, revenue from, is beholden to that oil price. But economic reforms have also not been coming to the fore, especially under Muhammadu Buhari's government, and reforms to, to the energy sector as a whole that most companies have been waiting upon. What's holding the APC back from having that as a program of action to boost the economic and job prospects of so many millions of young Nigerians? I think that is what um, Nigerians are now beginning to, to call a conundrum. We can't explain that situation. The reality facing this, the, the dire situation of the country is, is, is clear to everyone. Okay, even the APC government, because they came out with the Economic Recovery and Growth Plan uh, two years ago. So if you look at the plan, it has all the right elements. So we had expected that uh, the government would go ahead and implement the, the, the plan. But um, this is an administration that is more, that is very high on rhetoric than on actions. So we have not seen them match their, their words with, with corresponding actions. So it's been more of uh, the same thing, uh, more of politics. So everything in Nigeria today seems to be heavily politicized. And then um, you see there is so high level of uh, divisiveness in the system. Uh, I think that is uh, one thing that will go down uh, in record as one of the greatest achievements of this administration, because it has succeeded in dividing the country. So, um, and then it is not open to uh, constructive criticisms. So, when they talk about the achievements, uh, but you look around, you don't see much happening. So, we can't really, um, um, you know, associate those rhetorics to to actual. Uh, strategies of economic development or empowerment. Mm. So we've thought that the um, economic recovery and growth plan would have uh, changed the reality a little bit. Well, the economy has just registered marginal growth, and that is just on the back of uh, rising oil prices. Mm. But the structural um, uh, rigidities still persist in the economy. We have all manner of problems with the energy sector, even as I speak. Um, the the oil the electricity production is is below four thousand megawatts. Mm. I mean, and it has been that level for over 10, 10 years now. So it has not changed. We thought that would have changed because that's one of the change mantra that this government came to power with. Sounds very much like Nigeria and South Africa are going through the same kinds of problems. Our leaders keep telling us about economic recovery, but we ask the questions, where is it? If it's so, if it's so little, is it even negligible at all? But something that is changing within the Nigerian context is that the central bank governor, uh, Godwin Emifiele's term, is coming to an end in June. Do you think that if it is not extended and he is replaced by a different person, that will signify a change of monetary policy? And what would it signify if he's given an extension of tenure? Well, um, some of us think that if the government truly mean well for the economy, there is no point extending the tenure of the current uh, CBN governor, the Central Bank of Nigeria governor. 
Um, his monetary policies and strategies definitely hasn't worked. The test of the, the, of the burden is in the eating. So we, have, we haven't seen a conversion of those policies to actual um, um, economic development. So we've seen a very high interest rate in the system that has um, uh, disabled credit to the private sector. So for the first time in Nigeria, the production is at, uh, productivity is at, at an all-time low. Manufacturing GDP is still in recession, has not recovered. Mm. The real estate is still in recession, has not recovered. Now, government claims to be using targeted sector-specific policies, but we haven't seen the results, meaning that it is not working. So credit is at an all-time all low. Interest rate is very high. Uh, the ease of doing business has not improved. So um, if the government were to go ahead and renew the, the tenure of the current CBN government, that means they do not have the interest of Nigerians at heart, meaning that things will actually worsen. But if there is a change, and we believe and hope that there will mm. be one pretty, mm. uh, pretty soon, then that will signify a resolve on the part of the government to improve the situation of things. And we hope that can happen real quick. Dr. Adi, I thank you for your time.